This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with an extraordinary man who I've been learning a great deal from over the last couple of three years. His name is Stephen Herrmann. He is a Jungian psychologist who was trained at the C.G. Jung Institute in San Francisco, and he now is uh, welcome back to be a teacher and trainer of Jung analysts himself. Uh, he became very interesting to me, and as many in the audience know, I had a sailboat called Shaman, and somebody once gave me a book called Shaman's Call, and he <laughs> happened to be the author of that book. Mm. He has worked very much with a man we'll talk a lot about today uh, and written books about him. The Shaman's Call was about a man named William Everson, who is an extraordinary poet, was involved with the Catholic Church, taught at University of California, Santa Cruz, where, hello and behold, our guest today was his teaching assistant. And with an eye towards our Young Scholars Initiative, what Everson taught me in reading his book, Birth of a Poet, and I've learned more from Stephen, is about choice of vocation. And I see young economists coming in with all kinds of tools to learn and pressures to how to get tenure or how to build prestige, what constitutes a satisfying as opposed to a conforming career trajectory and all kinds of dilemmas that I know my young scholars work with. So I welcome Stephen and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I'm sure you will shed light on many of the how do I say, ways of approaching career development, and particularly uh, with the insights that you've culled together in your own research and learned from William Evers. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking with uh, you and with uh, the young scholars and uh, people who will be listening to this podcast. I um, am honored to be able to uh, tell you a little bit about my uh, background working with uh, the poet uh, in residence at UC Santa Cruz when I was a student. I was a young scholar myself then. Uh, this happened in uh, 1980 when uh, William Everson selected me to be his teaching assistant. And this was for a course that he called Birth of a Poet which originally uh, had a literary focus in the literature department, but then it broadened and opened itself up to uh, students from all different areas of uh, specialization at the university. And eventually there were uh, people coming from uh, many of the uh, different uh, schools, the campuses uh, at Santa Cruz, and um, the aim of the course was to see if you could confirm your vocation, your calling, uh, the calling from the inner voice, the uh, Stimme des Innos, uh, the inner voice, as uh, uh, Carl Jung uh, called it uh, in an essay by that title, uh, the in the development of the personality. Originally, it was called uh, the, the inner voice. Uh, Everson had been at the... Uh, Dominican uh, monastery in Oakland here at uh, St. Albert's. Uh, uh, he'd worked uh, as a lay monk uh, and a Catholic uh, a beat poet and a printer. And then um, he left the order after 18 years as a, as a monk and uh, then joined the faculty at UC Santa Cruz in the early 70s and uh, by the time I knew him, a decade had elapsed, and this course had evolved to the point where it had opened itself up, expanded to any uh, vocation, any charismatic vocation. Um, and the aim was to see if you could locate uh, in your uh, recording of dreams throughout the course of a quarter, uh, dreams with vocational significance. In other words, dreams that activated a certain um, uh, potential. Uh, that's latent in the human psyche uh, and that's based on an instinct, a, a basic human drive for action or a potential to uh, 
to have a certain uh, career uh, in the world. So the, the let me, aim let was me just a, interrupt for a yeah. second. Uh, my understanding that the Jungian perspective is, uh, to put it kind of simply, all of the things that affect your vocation are not self-evident and all right there on the kitchen table. So yeah. because of fear, because of blockages, sometimes it is through <laughs> dreams that these things knock on your door, give you the wake up call, urge you to make them conscious and move forward. So there's a there's a process here that's a little bit indirect. Definitely. The, the, the conscious mind thinks it's running the show, but really the, the unconscious plays a much larger role in the patterning of human destiny than one uh, at first uh, believes uh, due to education. And I think improper education, because uh, we don't, we're not trained uh, or educated to look to our dreams for vocational guidance, but that's the way I was uh, taught by Everson as a young man of 24. Um, and then uh, teaching Jung's theories of dream interpretation to the uh, students. Typically, there was 100 students in each class. And as you were saying, Rob, the unconscious is a lot wiser than uh, the, the ego and knows more about the source of our motivation, the source of our uh, psychic energy, where our drive to uh, being is, uh, existence in the world, to be a certain somebody, uh, to, the, to, to, to find meaning in life and purpose. Well, that comes out of a uh, foundation that's instinctual. And like uh, patterns of animal behavior, where uh, animals are uh, uh, know where to migrate, they know uh, which uh, course to take. A salmon, for example, knows which uh, stream bed to spawn up. Uh, it returns to the same uh, to the same water course, uh, the same river. So too, in in the human psyche, are there an instinctual patterns of behavior uh, that are, uh, as I said, uh, instinctual and uh, biological in their substrate, in their material substrate, in the body. And these archetypes, as Jung called them, these are portraits of instinct. They form themselves into vocational representations. And this is what Everson called a vocational archetype. So uh, the aim was to see if you could find your archetype. And of course, there's more than one archetype. You could be a musician and an economist. Uh, and a father and many other uh, callings to uh, marriage or parenthood, uh, these two are uh, profound uh, vocations or to a religious life. But ultimately, the thing that we do in our profession, such as, you know, my practice as a Jungian analyst, that becomes primary. That becomes the nuclear orienting uh, symbol, as I uh, found in my research at John F. Kennedy University, where I studied vocational dreams in early adulthood after my uh, time with Everson at Santa Cruz. Um, but we're going to be talking about William Everson today, and uh, I'm just uh, really amazed by the synchronicity, another Jungian term that Everson and I talked about uh, quite extensively. Um, that in sending me today, Rob, that uh, printout of the Tongs of Jeopardy on the uh, Everson's meditation in 1964 on the assassination of John F. Kennedy uh, Jr., which I had never read before, it helped me understand better not only the destiny of the nation that he talks about and the problems inherent in the nation and the national unconscious, but also my own personal destiny and how uh, after my work with Everson, I went to John F. Kennedy University. So I thank you for sending that today. It's uh, still, uh, it stirred my soul and uh, I'm still reverberating from, uh, from reading it this, this afternoon. When I read the preface to Bertho Poet, he talked about his teaching was in the form of meditation. And he said, at church you have a sermon most classrooms, you have a lecture. Those are like vertical hierarchies, whereas a meditation, 
is an interaction where the student is being asked to bring things out of themselves to the table. And there, which you might call psychic muscular power, is increased through that form of teaching as distinct from the passive sitting down low and listening to on high and knowing you got to remember it because you got to pass the test to get your grade. And I really thought there was something very refreshing about the way in which Everson imparted learning. But you were there. I wasn't. Is that a, <laughs> am I fantasizing or was that? Not uh, at all. Part, uh, part you're, of you're right on. Um, this is this is one of the most um, challenging things about dream work is the discipline that is required to get into a habit. Uh, William James uh our, our great American philosopher and the first uh, real American psychologist wrote so much about not only uh, automatic writing, which you mentioned, Rob, but also about um, uh, discipline uh, required uh, with uh, good habits. And um, when I was at Santa Cruz, I learned that uh, I was already recording dreams at UC Santa Cruz. And even before I met Everson, I was keeping a dream journal, but because I had found Jung at the age of 20. Uh, but being in the course provided a structure. Um, and then going to John F. Kennedy, where I did my research, um, John F. Kennedy University in Orinda, was in Orinda, California then. Um, I got into a habit where I could wake up uh, with the alarm clock every um, three hours into uh, sleep or, or 90 minute uh, REM cycle, sometimes four and a half hours into sleep, I'd set my alarm clock and wake up and I would be able to record a dream. And sometimes I'd catch two or three waves of these uh, dreams and write them in the journal. And it's amazing how much... Uh, the dream content can tell us about our daily uh, activities and what's a coming ahead because dreams have a perspective significance. They point to the future. There's a, a teleological dimension to dreams. So oftentimes the future is forecast in dreams. And um, that's why it's so good to get them uh, written down so that you can read them before you go to bed at night. And just that uh, process uh, reinforces the dream recall. If you uh, spend time uh, reading your dreams before sleep and then uh, telling yourself that you're gonna remember your dream in the morning as a kind of a dream incubation technique. Getting back to the uh, vocation of a sailor, the calling of uh, being a sailor, uh, you spoke about the fears of the unconscious, Rob, and that is one of the things that I think a lot of people uh, uh, experience. We all do to some degree, because the first figure that we encounter in relationship to the unconscious, according to Jung, is the shadow. And we don't typically want to look at what our negative uh, characteristics are, are uh, tendencies uh, that maybe are upsetting to people and the qualities of character that uh, w that uh, have been reinforced and are difficult to change because of the ego. And so the dreams, what they do is they relativize the ego. They, they soften that, um, that outer shell, so to speak, so that what can emerge through it are these, uh, these symbols, uh, God speaks through symbols, uh, Everson said in that uh, Tongues of Jeopardy uh, article. And that's true. Jung knew that. And so did the ancient Hebrews who wrote the Old Testament and then the, the New Testament uh, writers. Um, but also the, the theologians who were writing in the medieval period who Everson read, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, was a great teacher of Everson. So was St. Augustine. But later, in 1956, Everson um, met uh, the Dominican theologian Victor White, who was uh, at St. Albert's. And it was through Victor White that Everson uh, got turned on to Jung and then started reading Jung. And when he read Jung, 
he read Psychological Types, uh, volume six of the collected works. There's this essay by Jung on Meister Eckhart. So Everson began to read Eckhart in the order, and he learned from Eckhart how to use silence as a kind of trance-like technique on platform when he read poetry, so that he would bring his audience through uh, repose, as Eckhart called it, the repose, the quiet, the the silence of the in the soul. If you could find that still point, then you could create in the audience a kind of a uh, suspension of the rational functions of consciousness, uh, typically your thinking and feeling functions uh, that tend to run the show sometimes, the rational mind, uh, to activate the irrational functions. And Everson was an intuitive type. He was a, an irrational type and an introvert. But on platform, he was an extrovert. He really uh, used the platform as a way to bring out his inferior function. And he did this in a way that really spellbound the audience. And when he taught Birth of a Poet, he brought that same technique into the classroom. So the, it, it was enforced that nobody could talk during the, the meditations. And these lasted for an hour and a half uh, every Tuesday and Thursday. And uh, the students were instructed that they were not to, to speak. So there's a 100 students on uh, gym mats uh, in a circle, seated in a circle with our shoes off, typically, and uh, bare feet. You know, this is UC Santa Cruz. This is very, you know, much in the 70s now, 1979, when I took the course, and then 1980, 81, when I was a teaching assistant. And then Everson would be in the center, and he would just walk around in a circle sometimes. And he wore the traditional uh, regalia of... Uh, uh, a West Coast poet shaman, as he, he called himself. He wore a bear claw necklace and a buckskin vest, had little bells on his feet, and you'd hear him. It's, he sounded like a kind of a, like you were at a Sundance or like you were in a, at a Pueblo listening to Native Americans. You know, he, he brought the, the spirit of, of the indigenous peoples into the classroom so that there was no dividing line between uh, the, the nature of the psyche and the nature in the classroom. He brought nature into the classroom. And so getting back to what you said about the fear of the unconscious, uh, he meditated on the book by Joseph Campbell. Uh, each of the chapters uh, during uh, every week, he would uh, meditate on a different uh, chapter. And the the chapter that he, uh, he he focused on early in the course was called The Refusal of the Call. Now, the refusal of the call is the chapter in Joseph Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he narrates the story of Jonah and the whale, where Jonah refuses his call out of fear, the fear of actually having to go and speak to the people of Nineveh, which he was advised to do by the word of God, is, is what he refused, and the, the men threw him over the uh, uh, side of the uh, ship, and uh, he was swallowed by the great fish or the whale. And then there uh, he eventually remembered what his vocation was. And then he was able to uh, fulfill his, his destiny. So e Everson, of course, was the one who really introduced me to American poetry. And I became a a scholar of, of Herman Melville's great classic, Moby Dick, where in chapter uh, nine, the sermon, <laughs> and Everson often was giving sermons when he was meditating. Melville assumes the, uh, the mantle or the, 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 the persona of the prophet or the preacher. And he, he preaches to the, to the people, uh, the, the sailors. Uh, and narrates the story of Jonah and the whale. And he says there uh, uh, that whosoever is true to your own inexorable self, uh, a great, great delight will be experienced. Um, so this this idea of, uh, of speaking the truth, as he says, to the face of falsehood, uh, this is what uh, the call often uh, asks of us, 
Um, it relates to our democracy. It relates to economics. It, it relates to all of the vocations that have that uh, the Bob Dylan, for example, the musician on platform as well, who's giving his poem through song. There's a certain kind of courage that is involved, a heroic spirit that one has to uh, get in touch with. And often this does come during the heroic phase of life, which, as Jung said, uh, lasts until at least the age of 35. So the young scholars are just at that point where they're in the hero myth. They're living out a, a destiny pattern. And so listening to dreams is, is extremely important, uh, Rob, in, in being able to, to know whether or not you're on a true course. You're, whether you're, in, Ship is nav being navigated, you know, by the North Star, for example, which is would be in alignment with your destiny pattern. So there's a correlation between these uh, dreams, oftentimes, when we research them at a deep enough level. And in analytic work, I experience that sometimes in my um, uh, psychotherapy uh, work with patients, where there's a correlation between uh, an inner dream image and something that happens on the outside uh, in in the world, uh, such as not knowing really where I was going to start today. And then, Rob, you sending me that uh, uh, essay, The Tongs of Jeopardy, which is really a poem that's not published yet by Everson. But it reminded me of where my research uh, uh, in vocational dreams got centered after my time with Everson, because he became a kind of a self figure. When you project uh, uh, the image, you know, Everson was 44 years my senior. He was like a wise old man figure. He was not just the father, the spiritual father I never had. He was like a spiritual grandfather. He was like the, the old um, uh, shaman figure who delivered some kind of message and confirmed for me back then even at 24, that my calling was to be a Jungian analyst when I didn't really have full belief in myself yet. You know, when we're young, we don't always know uh, where our confidence foundation is, where we stand uh, in relationship to the self. Oh, but through a relationship like that, and uh, it could be to an economist, um, you, sometimes something happens in your uh, career where where a door opens where you least expected it to open, and um, and that's a, an indication that you're on the right track. And you know it by the feeling element. You know William James wrote so much about the varieties of religious experience. Well, being in Everson's presence was like that um, for me and for many of the other students uh, at Santa Cruz. Not everybody got the message uh, from Everson. Uh, there's always uh, resistance. And um, he was, in some ways, a, a very uh, unique individual and stood outside of the average person because he, he, first of all, he dressed in a way that was just um, unheard of, really, at a university. And yet Santa Cruz was an experimental place where he could really be himself and uh, uh express his uh, character, his personality, uh, his individuality. And um, I think that's one of the things that uh, uh, we have fears of uh, uh, enacting. You know, you mentioned uh, social psychology, Rob. Uh, well, one of the uh, outstanding uh, leaders uh, of the... Um, time in Jungian psychology here on the West Coast was a figure named Ira Progoff. And his first book was actually a dissertation. It was called Jung's Psychology and Its Social Meaning. And uh, he went to Zurich to talk to Jung about this manuscript. And they ended up throwing the I Ching together, the ancient Chinese oracle, the Book of Changes. And he, when the coins landed, uh, the 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 oracle gave Progoff a reading that just seemed too profound. It was called Crossing the Great Water, and he had just crossed the Great Water to go to visit Jung. But there, there was this sense about um, synchronicity 
that really spoke to uh, Progoff at the time, because Jung had just written his essay on synchronicity. And so Progoff then later wrote a book called Jung, Synchronicity and Human Destiny. And this is one of the subjects that Everson and I talked about uh, at great length, and that uh, is in a chapter in the book, um, uh, William Everson, The Shaman's Call. And that's one that you were uh, referring to, I think, before we started to record, Rob. So I just wanted to make that connection uh, with social science and Progoff, because he was a very important figure. And at the same time that Everson was developing this hypothesis that I later tested at UC Santa Cruz for validity, empirical validity, that there is a vocational archetype in the human psyche, and it can be confirmed through a study of dreams. Ira Progoff, in his work in uh, Depth Psychology and Modern Man, had developed this idea of dynotypes, as he called them, enacting images. Uh, so images of activity. So they were, they were essentially speaking about uh, an analogous uh, subject Everson's was a more, uh, you could say, um, religious view because he came from a Dominican background, a Catholic background, and used uh, uh, the kind of language that uh, uh, that Progoff was not using as a social scientist. Um, but um, it's not so much the uh, the language that matters as it is the the. The, the the facts of experience that are being studied and and that's these uh these portraits uh of instinct uh uh a vocational instinct i we could call it or uh, a destiny instinct and um and it's uh those images that uh uh, have a certain kind of numinous uh, feeling associated with them. This is a term that Carl Jung borrowed from uh, the uh, the classical scholar uh, Rudolf Otto, who wrote a book called uh, The Idea of the Holy, or Das Heilige in German. And there he coined this term numinous. Uh, so when we talk about archetypal experiences, one of the fears that we have in, in approaching the unconscious is the numinosity of uh, the archetypes, that they have an sometimes overwhelming uh, uh, light uh, that can be emitted from them that can, can either be dark or light. You know, it, there's a certain darkness to the shadow, for example, the personal shadow or the collective archetypal shadow. Uh, and um, uh, one encounters both polarities uh, when one begins to open up to the what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. The other term we were talking about earlier, Rob, was the idea of a psychoid continuum that Jung found later in life extended beyond the collective unconscious. And this includes matter that uh, uh, things can happen uh, in the outside world where one can dream, for example, of a coyote and then go for a hike and suddenly a coyote makes its appearance on the trail uh, or a snake, for example. Uh, and that kind of thing has happened to me. In fact, it happened when I was uh, when I graduated from UC Santa Cruz. Um, I had a dream about a king snake. This is a California king snake, a natural predator of the rattlesnake. And that led me to the uh, make a decision to write my, uh, to study with Everson, uh, to write my own individual major in depth psychology and religion, which was taking a risk uh, in my academic career, but I, I, ha I followed the call. And then uh, when I graduated from uh, John F. Kennedy University with my master's degree in Orinda, I was driving home uh, after the uh, graduation and there around sunset uh, on the uh, road heading up to uh, the house where I was living, uh, I just about ran over a, a California king snake and uh, scooped it up and, and took it took it home and gave it some water to drink and then let it go in the hills. Um, but these kinds of things happen. You have a dream about a particular dream animal or an 
a totem animal, an ally, as they're called in shamanism sometimes, and suddenly it makes its appearance uh, in your outer physical life. And how that happens is a mystery. But Jung called those uh, encounters uh, synchronicity. And um, these are a-causal events. The dream doesn't cause the outer event to happen, but through the constellation of an archetype, uh, there can be a correspondence between the psyche and nature, or psyche and matter. And so Everson really tried to bring this together in Birth of a Poet by dressing like a... Uh, uh, a Native American uh, shaman uh, with the beat look. I mean, the long flowing black, you know, gray hair with a long gray beard. He was, he was, I think, 69 when I met him and uh, really looked like kind of the prototypical figure of a, a West Coast um, poet prophet, pro, poet shaman. You know, he was really... Uh, he carried that mantle, as he would call it, kind very of a precursor well. to the beat generation. And uh, yes, he was part of that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it's interesting. Uh, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about there. There are things they may be intuitive or conscious, but my understanding from listening to you is that when you come into a classroom and he does meditations. It's almost like asking you to take off your armor. Take take off your armor. It's not a request. It's not a demand, but it's a softening so that you can be more impressionable without being afraid. And, uh, and I think in some of the vocational stories you tell, it's how you go from, can I do this, to I can do this. It's... Uh, you you have a sense or a uh, an intuition that you're being pulled or you're being drawn in a direction, but something happens that catalyzes it, brings a confidence, and uh, I think uh, I think it's fascinating. Was he controversial when he came on stage in uh, at Santa Cruz with other faculty, with the administration, or what have you, or was it just a beautiful time of experimentation? at Santa Cruz where uh, it, it just flowed. Oh, I don't think he was uh, controversial. When he looked at you, sometimes he could, he had a piercing kind of a, a, a glance. That he, he was not just looking at you or into your eyes, he was looking into your soul. And that could be terrifying itself to really be seen by somebody at that depth. You, you mentioned his feeling, Rob. That was the other thing he could feel into the depths of a person's soul uh, and know something about them through his intuition. Cause he was an intuitive feeling type. And so, yeah, he, he had um, very unusual characteristics that I, I, I can see could be frightening at first and let, until you got to know him. And then he was just gentle I can't remember seeing him angry. Uh, so I don't know how he, where he, how he contained it, but he had a real awareness of his own potential for violence. You saw it in the Tongues of Jeopardy, Rob, where, you know, he said he felt like he was closer to Oswald than he, he w was to a Kennedy because Kennedy was such an ideal political figure that but he was very aware of his shadow that he, that any of us could become an Oswald. Now, this is a very Jungian idea. It's, it's, it's a horrifying thought, really. Uh, but he talks about this in his meditations in the power of the negative, how the shadow has the potential to cap, capture the archetype of our vocation and lead us into the wrong, uh, path. Uh, and this could be um, in any calling that anyone has a potential to act out the shadow and become a shadow dominated personality. If one doesn't do one's own individual work, one's own inner work. And that's why dreams are so important, because there you see the villain. There you see, you know, the murderer. You see uh, the attacking animal. You see 
the more you look at your dreams, the more you'll see the violence of the unconscious. And, um, you know, we're going through a time right now in the nation where the national psyche is very stirred up. Uh, there, there's a lot of political unrest. And Everson's portraying the, uh, the conflict as uh, the conflict between Cain and Abel, the, the two hostile brothers in the, um, the, the, the drama of the American uh, psyche around the death of President Lincoln, um, was very interesting from the point of view of what Jung, Carl Jung has written about the hostile brother motif, that we see this in the, the feuding between the Republican and the Democratic parties, that there's a lot of animosity. There's a lot of uh, unconscious uh, envy and hatred and a lot of dark energies are flowing through the national psyche right now. And this is what M Herman Melville uh, explored so magnificently in our great American novel in Moby Dick between Ahab and, and Ishmael and his wife, uh, uh, Queequeg, the Polynesian harpooner, who he sleeps with in the Spouter Inn. In chapter 10, a bosom friend, he brought this back from the Polynesian islands from his sailing days as a sailor. Uh, and so he brought back already the, the archetype, you could say, for same-sex marriage is right there in our great American novel in chapter 10 of Moby Dick, that he foresaw this. You see, the, the great shaman poet like that, um, uh, like Melville was, uh, uh, and like Whitman was, and like Emily Dickinson were, uh, they have the ability to see things a hundred years in advance because of their intuitive, as you mentioned, visionary yes. uh, consciousness. Um, well, you you did a um, a discussion about shamanism with Everson for a San Francisco Jungian journal that I once read, and he talked oh, about yes. that the shamanism to him was like trance like. Being able yeah. to get into a trance so yeah. that you can open up to what's really happening and yes. shake off the false consciousness <laughs> and yeah. the, uh, how would I shake say, the, the um, mm -hmm. story that we shared before this today with the, about the tongs of jeopardy and about mm -hmm. uh, the murder of JFK mm -hmm. and all the dilemmas, he says, this is this man who you just described moments ago as soft and gentle and mm -hmm. has a feminine side, etc. Mm -hmm. And then he says, for man thinks logically, he feels he can understand only what he can reduce to reason in its terms. But God acts symbolically, confounding man's logic. He thrusts upon him the most profound and disturbing significations and holds them there until the depth of implication is ineradicably registered. Then the inner reality concealed in the heart of things, which human logic never perceives, shakes the mind out of a dream of superficial well-being, a dream that was actually leading to disaster. I, when I read that, I just thought that's a false consciousness about unregulated financial markets. Mm. And we have seen, mm. whether it's financial governing officials or United States legislature, the surveys of Gallup, Richard Edelman, and others about expertise and governance have collapsed since the great financial crisis. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to a man like Frank Knight, who was a person who wrote about radical uncertainty, the unknowing, you see that there were, in that case, famous economists who were, what you might call, put in storage, but who, and John Maynard Keynes for that matter, he wrote his dissertation on a treatise on probability. And it was about the unknown and unknowable unknowns of the future. So this, I guess what I find so interesting about Everson is he maintains 
a softness and a constructiveness and a vehemence at the same time about how we can get off course. There's a, a, a kind of anchored conviction within him at the same time that he isn't like a charismatic promising you false certainties so that you feel comfortable until such time that he's unmasked of having been telling untruthful false certainties. And uh, so I, I really find this this dynamic that you're bringing forth and uh, interesting. And one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about was Robertson Jeffers. Mm -hmm. The book that I bought from Lime Kiln Press was called Tragedy Has Obligations. Mm -hmm. And there is the poem of that name. And it made me think that Robertson Jeffers is his kind of his North Star in poetry. Mm -hmm. He was so mm -hmm. vehement and so intense. I found the language that he brought to bear uh, yeah. quite fierce. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, very fierce. So, mm -hmm. so there's this combination of self-confidence mm -hmm. that's grounded, mm -hmm. but caring about others, and then um, mm -hmm. managing, like you said, through the meditations and courses in Birth of a Poet, nurturing other people. And, and how mm -hmm. he put all those together in the same package is really brilliant. It's mm -hmm. it's very complicated and subtle. Mm -hmm. But uh, but take, uh, for instance, tragedy has obligations, the first passage. If I'd thrown a little more boldly in the flood of fortune, you'd have had England. Or in the slackening, less boldly, you'd have not sunk your right hand in Russia. These are two ghosts. They stand by the bed and make a man tear his flesh. The rest is fatal. Each day a new disaster. At last, five ictus. It means, weiden uh, gishten. This is the essence of tragedy. To have meant well and made woe, and watch fate all stone approach. The, there is a vehemence in that poem, and a criticism of false mm -hmm. certainties. Yeah. At the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's almost like you've got to be vehemently comfortable with not knowing or not being able to get closure on knowing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, it's, no, it's, I like what it's you're just saying a about very delicate, and, yeah. but it's at odds mm -hmm. with performing for the peer review journals or appearing <laughs> at the big policy meetings and trying not to be controversial. Mm-hmm when mm -hmm. the stakes, for instance, of not funding climate change in the global south can affect us all. And the, the critiques of money and politics, the standing and watching mm -hmm. leaders in mm -hmm. both parties becoming mm -hmm. centimillionaires mm -hmm. as yeah. professional legislators. I mean, mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. There's a lot going on here that yeah. is very yeah. unwholesome and is not uh, mm -hmm. what you might call brought onto center stage by any of the paradigms in social science. Well, when we look at the news, uh, what's not on central stage is, I think, and, until there's a disaster and then it is on center, central stage. But um, what's not being put on central stage is the, the the uncertainty, as you're saying, and the unknowability about what's lurking around the corner with regards to climate change. And speaking of Robinson Jeffers, uh, he wrote, this is in the 1940s now, Rob, he wrote, the polar ice caps are melting. Hmm. Soon London and uh, wow. LA, Los Angeles will be underwater. But then he goes to talk about the tower that he built out of these stones that he he dredged up from Point Carmel and made into a structure that he called Hawk Tower. And in that poem, he says that uh, in an, the Hawk Tower will, will will become geological, fossil, permanent. Uh, 
The water will cover the tower, but it will remain, and the little fish will swim by. And now he's foreseeing all this um, 80 years ago. This is this is the, the the way in which a shaman poet like that can can foresee things, foresee developments. The the polar ice caps are melting. Um, he wrote a poem called Cassandra because he felt like he was a Cassandra that people weren't listening. Um, but about this uh, tower, he he starts off in a poem called Rock and Hawk. Oh, I, I just lost you. Uh, uh, you lost a. Oh, I did see. You lose I'm me? not. I, no, I'm okay. I'm not. I wasn't hearing you. Um, you're good. I, I'm. I'm absolutely stunned right now. Because as we were talking, I got an alert from Maria Popova, and the headline that came up, this came up onto the screen of my computer. The underratedly wonderful Robertson Jeffers on moral beauty and the interconnectedness of the universe and the key to peace of mind. <laughs> And it's wow. a story which I, I'll post with this podcast, and I'll send it to you about. Well, that's a, him. It, it, just as you were talking about him, and it, it was just stunning. It's a short little piece, and uh, Jeffrey's Jeffers writes. I'm just excerpting quickly. It is sort of a tradition in this country not to talk about religion for fear of offending. I'm still a little subject to the tradition and rather dislike stating my attitudes, except in the course of a poem. However, they are simple. I believe the universe is one being and all its parts are different expressions of the same energy and they're all in communication with each other, influencing each other and therefore parts of one organic whole. This is physics, I believe, as well as religion. <laughs> So, uh, at any rate, we got a message go. from the late uh, Robinson Jeffers. Well, and there you go, physics as well as religion, and you see what Jung described as synchronicity happening yes. right on the screen there, yeah. <laughs> uh, where she just, the hit popped That's, up right at that moment. Wow, wow. <laughs> so there you are. Um, that's, that's what happens when uh, things get, get constellated around uh, ideas. Uh, Archetypes are uh, uh, ideas as well as images. And so we start talking and things begin to happen sometimes. This is when we touch into that psychoid depth uh, where matter gets affected. It's even affecting our computer screens as, <laughs> as we're talking. Um, yeah, I... Uh... <sighs> I think this kind of creativity, I, I did, I made a note of a quote that Kennedy made about Robert Frost, mm -hmm. about the role of the artist, of the poet, of the mm -hmm. mystic, etc. Mm -hmm. But Kennedy was just talking about Robert Frost, and he says, strength mm -hmm. takes many forms. And the most obvious forms are not always the most significant. The men who create power make an indispensable contribution to the nation's greatness. But the men who question power make a contribution just as indispensable, especially when that questioning is disinterested, for they determine whether we use power or power uses us. And uh, I thought as a, as a tribute, he was essentially saying, well, I was going on, Robert Frost coupled poetry and power, for he saw poetry as a means of saving power from itself. When power leads men towards arrogance, poetry reminds him of his limitations. When power narrows the man's, the, excuse me, when power narrows the areas of a man's concerns, poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of his existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses, for art establishes the basic human truth, which must serve as a touchstone of our judgment. The artist, however, faithful to his personal vision of reality, becomes the last champion of the individual mind and sensibility against an intrusive society and an officious state. In pursuing his perceptions of reality, he must often sail against the currents of his time. This is not a popular role. If sometimes great artists 
have been most critical of society, it's because their sensitivity and concerns for justice, which must motivate any true artist, make them aware of our nation falling short of its highest potential. I see little more importance to the future of our country and our civilization than to fully recognize the place of the artist. That's John F. Beautiful. Kennedy talking from the White House. That's John F. Kennedy. Yeah. Wow. Uh, he's talking yeah. upon the death of Robert Frost, I'm went to uh, University of Massachusetts up in Amherst mm -hmm. and made a speech because Frost mm -hmm. had come to his inauguration and mm -hmm. created poetry and read some poetry. And so he went back mm -hmm. up in honor of his life. But I think uh, it, this, what I like about the poetry and the art is it's not a weapon being used to make you afraid. Mm -hmm. It's a method of illumination. And that's what I learned mm -hmm. from Everson is that he's trying to bring us all to a higher level of awareness mm -hmm. and less afraid mm -hmm. and therefore less clinging to false consciousness out of fear for ourselves or our own ratings of approval or disapproval by our peer groups. And I think at a time like this, when the fears are so high, starting from the framework like you've built in your professional life and working with these pathways to challenge and illumination at times when things have been off course, is the only is the only way forward, and uh, I don't I don't think resignation is an option. Constructive evolution, as you said earlier, of finding the next north star. Mm -hmm. Who right now? I mean, we have had people like Joseph Henderson and mm -hmm. Donald Sandler and others. Mm -hmm. Is there are there people now at the vanguard? of the discipline along with yourself that you would mention to our viewers today and our listeners? Oh, definitely. Um, I, I want to mention Murray Stein. Uh, he's a Zurich analyst now. He lives in Zurich. He's from Chicago, uh, but uh, migrated to Switzerland, now lives uh, in Zurich. He is the... Uh, founder and the president of uh, uh, ISAP, the International Society for Analytical Psychology. He founded his own institute uh, in, in um, Zurich. And um, I've read uh, pretty much uh, most of his books, I would say. Um, he's writing his collected works now. Uh, and I've reviewed uh, several of his books for the San Francisco Young Institute Library Journal. And he's been a great um, inspiration for me and um, uh, really is a magnificent writer and thinker. And one of the leading lights in uh, our field of uh, Jungian or analytical psychology Um so I'll mention him, uh, Rob. Well, I'll audience. put a man who's been a absolutely vital life coach for me in making transitions, who also lives like you in Northern California, John O'Neill. John has written a number of books, but uh, the one that caught my attention before I met him in person is called The Paradox of Success. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, he was a Jungian psychologist trained by Joseph Henderson. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, how would I say, every time I, I get all bottled up, he unlocks me. <laughs> he's an artist. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but uh, I think uh, he's got a book called The Whole Enchilada uh, about all of <laughs> the different challenges in his patients and mm. I get mm -hmm. criticized constructively in those in those chapters, but uh, but I think John's a very loving soul and has done a tremendous amount for many many people, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, how do I say bringing this from just personal counseling 
to, I, I almost feel like the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve and the Internal Revenue Service and the Department of Energy and the Securities and Exchange Commission all should have Jungian advanced degrees so that we can <laughs> see what we're not seeing constructively. And uh, because there, this, uh, how do I say, this realm in which you approach the challenge is a very different mindset than what we are trained in engineering or economics or other forms of social science. Tell me before we uh, sign off, what are you what are you working on right now? What's the, what's the next thing this audience can expect to see when they sign on mm -hmm. for book parties or or promotions <laughs> in the in the coming well, months? Or are you making movies? <laughs> uh, what 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 what's well, on deck right now? No, no, no movies. Uh, um, you know, I, I'm going to live my life like you said in the unknown, in the unexpected. Uh, right now and just see what uh emerges i'm working on a couple of uh, manuscripts a few <laughs> the melville manuscript is still unpublished and i'm working on a, a book project uh, that's been uh, ongoing for over 40 years that everson supervised at uc santa cruz that was my senior thesis on meister eckhart and carl jung i'm, I'm uh, halfway through that uh book project and also, I have a, a, a book on vocational dreams that comes from my research uh, at John F. Kennedy University. So, and then uh, as well as uh, the, uh, the chapters that I've been writing uh, subsequent to that time um, in courses that I've taught at the Jung Institute and, and elsewhere. Um, so I've got several things going. I've got a lot of unpublished poetry but I like to work in the garden, get my hands in the uh, in the dirt, and uh, uh, watch the flowers grow, and uh, welcome the hummingbirds and the flowers and bees and uh, butterflies uh, to try to help them uh, survive uh, the uh, the current uh, time that we're going through. And uh, I I just uh, I, I'm so ad admiring Rob of. Uh, how much uh, knowledge you've uh, assimilated since I've known you uh, in a relatively uh, short, I could say, period of time. Uh, how much uh, you've read in, in Jungian psychology is, is really uh, uh, remarkable. And uh, I, I wish more economists uh, would, would follow in your footsteps and uh, Get on the shaman, you know, boat uh, with you, and uh, take a trip up north to uh, find your albatross, and uh, not not from Coolridge's albatross around his neck, but the one that curls up next to you and and provides that kind of nurturance and play. I, I liked what you said about the play instinct. You, <laughs> Schiller, in his uh, aesthetic education letters on the education of man, talked about the importance of the play instinct, and I get that sense about you that you really bring a lot of play into your work and maybe that comes from your music too. Uh, so uh, you just keep, uh, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, I, I, I love, I love your work and, and uh, I think the Institute is, uh, is, is uh, the way of the future in, in economics. Well, I so, hope to uh, validate what you project. I know who knows what the future is, but uh, <laughs> I hope I can stand there in five years and you'll say that was well done and we'll, we'll keep trying. But the, uh, Par the, the energy that you success. bring, you're, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just the paradox of success. I just wanted to, you know, reiterate the title of your friend's book there. Uh, yeah. that there is a paradox there. Yeah. Well, John, uh, is very, uh, how do I say, deeply Jungian. And uh, <laughs> he had been an executive at AT&T and other things in his yeah, own see. life. And uh, mm -hmm. I think he's seen the silver linings and the dark side of many things. And uh, mm -hmm. he, he imparts a kind of wisdom to those who he consults with. Mm -hmm. But the, um, you know, and I know your spouse is involved in the 
Jungian world of arts, and that, that's, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, music. That's a, when I met her, she's mm -hmm. uh, got a lot to offer as well. So you, you know, how do they say you got a team with two horses <laughs> pulling the buggy? That's great. Yes, I, I'm. I couldn't do it without her, and uh, she's uh, Lori Goldrich. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife is a Jungian analyst at. Uh, the San Francisco Jung Institute, who's teaching active imagination and dream work. And, and uh, yeah, we, we loved having you at our home, Rob, and uh, hearing about uh, your stories, your wonderful stories about your trips north. And Yeah, um, well, so thanks said, for mentioning, Lori. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I've been lucky, so uh, I've got to knock mm -hmm. on wood to keep it going. But uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you for being with me today and uh, exploring, by the way, what inspired us, we did not discuss with the audience, but what inspired us to get together today and now was that it's 29 years to the day yesterday when William Everson died. And while we've been in lots of dialogue and you've been a shepherd in teaching me how to get down the tracks and uh, we've enjoyed things like talking about the movie The Whale as you're working on Melville, uh, Mm -hmm. I did want to underscore that the, the thing that brought us to the table today is to honor the life of William Everson, who passed away 29 years ago yesterday. Yeah, thank you, Rob, for for uh, remembering remembering that. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Everson's buried at the uh, Benicia Cemetery, the Dominican Cemetery in Benicia, where I've been mm. uh, numerous times to uh, visit his grave. And I was honored to have been one of the pallbearers at his, uh, wow. at his funeral. Yeah. Well, how would you say? Yeah. He may have passed, but his echoes are going to create the birth of many more poets. I'm confident of that, particularly with you carrying yeah. the ball. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, many other uh, vocations uh, in addition to the poet. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Thanks so much for uh, having me on. My pleasure. Uh, your show, Rob. This will be the first uh, of, I'm sure, be several chapters. And uh, I know my young scholars have been encouraging me to uh, perhaps make a course with you on these uh, vital issues, because we are working with the Young Scholars Initiative very seriously to create the leaders mm -hmm. of the future. And the leaders of the future who have a deeper sense of the nature of the challenge and can learn from people like you mm -hmm. and the work of Everson and Robinson Jeffers mm -hmm. and John O'Neill will be better equipped to serve society. Thanks again. We'll talk Thank again you, soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.